Good morning and welcome to A Life Change. This is Eileen Hicks and I am so blessed that you're able to be with me this morning. January 1st, 2017. How did it get here so fast? What a wonderful opportunity. Let's pray as we get started. Almighty God, we uh, thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come and listen to your word. God, we lift up our lives. We lift up this next year to you and ask that we would hear from you, Lord, that we would follow you closely and we would do your will. God, we thank you and we praise you for all that you have done in your son's most precious name. Amen. Well, can you believe it? January 1st, 2017 is here. Now, granted, I'm still recording it in 2016 because it's Friday uh, Friday morning. After I get off the radio with Joe, I, I come over here to record this. I find it a great honor and a privilege to be able to come over and share um, my passion to share what is most important to me, um, my faith with you. I know that I have so many people to be grateful for, for this opportunity. The radio station, Loretta, Michelle, Joe, D-Rock, Carrie, all the people who work here, I am so blessed and thankful for. I'm thankful that um, I work at a church that is super excited that I get to share the word on Sunday morning. I'm super excited that they also have an hour on this station on Sunday morning, giving the opportunity for many people to hear. Thankful that other ra- other churches also have committed time, energy, and money to putting stuff on the radio that uh, God's word would go forth. I'm thankful for my family that doesn't seem to be bothered at all that uh, I get up very early on Friday mornings, come in and clown around with Joe and then get to come in here. This is one of the blessings, the blessings of, of being able to do what I do. I probably have one of the best, uh, probably the best job in the world, but there are certainly some extra things I get to do because of the opportunities afforded me um, because of, of God. God helps me God leads me to these things. So I'm super thankful for that. I'm thankful that you would listen. I'm thankful for those who um, comment to me that they've heard. Um, But just as you look through this year, 365 days, 12 months, many hours, many minutes, many seconds that will happen in this next year, what what are we going to do with it? What is on your heart or your mind or your soul What changes are there that uh, God is asking you to look at? So let's say this morning that I have $1,440 in my pocket. Now, I want you to know that I only carry uh, maybe $10 in cash ever. Very rarely do I have any cash on me. But let's say I give it to you. And then I say to you, I will only give this to you if every day for the rest of your life, you take $20 of that 144 and spend it on me every day. So you're going to get it every day, but you have to spend $20 on me every day. Well, how do you think that would make you feel? Do you think that you'd make that deal? I think I probably would. But will you hold a grudge that you have to spend $20 on me every day? I don't know. Most likely we would say yes. I'll buy him a shirt and once in a while I'll feel generous and you'll spend 25 or 30 or 400 on holidays. No big deal. Well, think about that. There's 1,440 minutes in every day. And every minute of that is a gift from God. He's, of course, not obligated to give it to you or me. It's not. It's something that he gives freely not anything that we can do on our own. God enables us to live. He gives it to us as a gift. Do you know that every single day, God gives you 1,440 minutes every day of your life? Is it too much to ask to spend 20 minutes of that with God? Just thank him for the day. Just have a relationship with him. The God who gives you every minute 
that you have. Can you say no? My day is booked. I have lots of things to do. I don't have time for God. That's like giving you money and telling you to spend it all on myself. Have enough to give away or something back. Well, are you kidding me that you would have nothing after that to pay back? None of that to share with someone else? When you put it in those terms, of course, when you think of spending 20 minutes with God every day, it doesn't sound like a whole lot. But how do we expect to grow in our relationship with God if we don't spend time with him? If you even spend 15 minutes having a relationship with God, I promise you, it will change your life. I'm picking um, Psalms 119, 9 through 16 as the scripture for today. So let me read that whole piece to you now. How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. I do, do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount the law that comes from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statues as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decree. I will not neglect your word. Well, verse 9 says, you know, how do we keep his way um, pure? The psalmist asks that question, how can a young people keep that way pure? The answer is really simply by living according to God. God gives us numerous examples of people who decided to not live according to his will or live according to his word. Daniel, when he and his three friends were taken from their home, they made up their mind not to defile themselves. The king's choice of food or wine. So he asked permission of the commander officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel made his mind up and his heart, the height of a teenager, would not compromise the laws of God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also, when they were a teenager, made up their minds and heart not to compromise the commandments of the God. So we should do the same. Seek you with all of our heart, Lord. Do not let us stray from your commands. We have hidden your word in our heart. Living according to the word by. They're calling us out to listen and obey the word of God. James tells us professing Christians do not merely listen to the word. So to deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Seeking God with all of our hearts. I seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands, is verse 10. How many of us can say that we seek the Lord with all of our hearts? I want you more than anyone or anything. But a psalmist says, I seek you with all of my being. All of me to my very core, all throughout the book of Psalms, we hear words like 84 2. My soul yearns, even faints, at the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out to the living God. Do you beg the same thing? Psalms 27 8. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Psalms 42, 1 and 2, as a deer pants for the stream of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God, when I can go and meet him. When have we looked for God? When have we yearned for him to be a part of every moment of every day? When I was um, first learning to read the Bible, 
I was having a whole lot of trouble. Um, I started in Genesis and I would get to Deuteronomy and I would, I would fail. I, and I would tell myself that, that I had failed and I would try again and, and I might make it through, um, Exodus, Leviticus. And, and then again, somewhere in Leviticus, I would stop and I would feel that I had failed again. Well, some of the things that we need to know is that it is a beautiful story that spans the whole Bible. And when we read one verse or two verses, we're not getting the big picture. Our brain and our heart and our soul are not able to connect in. A lot of people read just a few verses a day, just a few, not, um, not any great amount. So imagine if you had your very favorite book, um, I would say a James Patterson usually in my world, and, and you could only read a couple paragraphs a day. Would you want to read more? Well, yeah. How would you feel if you said you could only read a couple of paragraphs a day? Wouldn't you feel like you had been, been quarantined, put in a box, kept from God's word? It, it would be the same with God's word, as I just said, that, that when we only read a little here, a re- little there, we don't see the overarching theory, the overarching um, theology of the whole story that ebbs and flows through these words and stories and parables and psalms and pieces that have been meticulously put together that we might learn more about the character of God that we might grow in our character to be in, made in the image of God, but then to share his image with others, to share what he would have for us to do. So if we only read one or two verses at a time, we never get that opportunity. So when I was, when I was first reading, I would pray and I would ask God to help me want to, to read. God, I pray that I want to read. Help me, Lord, to want to read the Bible, that I would learn more about you and your son, that I would understand what the Trinity is. I would understand what you're asking of me. I would understand ultimately what grace is. And I want you to know that I don't know if it was the prayer or my commitment to the prayer, or my commitment to trying over and over again, or me asking someone how to start reading the Bible, or the book I read about being a novice at reading the Bible. How do I understand these words? Well, the thing I was told was to start in the Gospels. To start in the Gospels and to read the stories. To read the things from heading to heading, to not stop if possible, to give myself more than 20 minutes in the word, because when you get to 20 minutes, then your brain clicks into story mode. You're not just reading words. You look for the whole um, strings that tie and hold things together. So when do I seek God with all my heart? When do I look at his word and try and see his face? When do we do this? Well, I think that there's a lot of times that we want to do this. We think we're going to do this, and yet we do not. We do not. In verse 11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart. So how do we hide God's word in our heart? Psalmist says, the word I treasure in my heart The word is being hidden and stored up there as something valuable like a treasure. Did you have a little box as as a kid where you put all your treasures in? My uh, stepmother gave me um, some false graph for Christmas that she had found. My pattern has been long since retired. And she had gone to an auction and found of these special pieces. And she brought them to me as a treasure because she had found something amongst um, things that may have meant nothing to people, but it meant so much to her and giving it meant so much to me. It was a treasure. Hiding his word in our hearts means not just reading it, but also studying it and especially trying to memorize it. 
Now, I know, I know there are many people out there and you're going to tell me you cannot memorize it. I understand that you say that. I want you to know that I, too, have said that. But I want you to know, right now, I could do the entire song of Bohemian Rhapsody. And it's not a short song. I have two or three other songs, American Pie, Alice's Restaurant, all very long songs with lots of words. And I know those. And yet I say I can't memorize God's word. Well, the interesting thing is, is I don't do it with the same excitement and encouragement and the same want. So if I turned myself to want to memorize God's word, I would certainly be able to do it. When the word of God is readily available in our minds, that we can recall it at a moment, at the moment of temptation or need. Remember after the baptism of Christ, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days. Turned stone into bread? That was a temptation. Attempted with power and glory. Throw himself down from here and see if God catches him. All three times Jesus quoted scripture from the book of Deuteronomy, where I'd stopped before. While going through his trials, Job said in 2312, I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. I beg you this week, I beg you, each and every one of you this week, to flood your heart with God's word. When your words Jeremiah fifteen sixteen When your words came I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I was given a story about Michael Bellister, a Bible distributor who visited a small village in Poland shortly after World War II. He gave Bibles to the villagers who then who was converted. So he gave one Bible to this man and he was converted. A new believer then passed the pages from the books to others. The cycle of people coming to the Lord continued till 200 people had become believers through that one Bible. When Bellister returned, this group of Christians met together for a worship service in which he was to preach the word. He normally asked for testimonies, but this time he suggested that several in the audience recite verses of scripture. One man said, stood and said, perhaps we misunderstood. Do you mean verse or chapter? These villagers had not memorized a few select verses in the Bible, but whole chapters of the book. Thirteen people knew the whole book of Matthew, Luke, and half of Genesis. Another person, the book of Psalms. A single copy of the Bible was given by Bellister had done all this work. Isn't that pretty amazing that just this story could do that? Because they were given in rations, pages. They memorized those words. They stored them in the heart so that at a moment's notice they could recall those words. Full books they memorized because they did not have his word in their hands. The word was changed between people and people. And they only had it for a short time. And during that short time, they stored it all up in their heart. Well, why, why do we do this? Well, the question of the next verse is, um, and 11b is, why should we do it? And the answer is that I might not sin against you. Now, we ask why we should. What is it for? The psalmist tells us that we might not sin against God. How many of us here out there desires to not be sinful? We all do. Many of us, 
in this lifetime as Christians will never, of course, lead a sinless life. But in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, tells us that all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Well, 12 through 16 asks, how do we do that? Well, by being teachable. Praise be to you, God, O Lord, to teach me your decrees. That's what verse 12 said. The psalmist here asks God to teach me your word. He recognizes that it is God, the Holy Spirit, who teaches. Paul's 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. In John 14, 26, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. John 16, 13 says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. So we have to be teachable. How do we, how do we do that? Well, we have to be open to it. And if we've read the Bible many times, you've read a scripture many times, look at it different. Put different um, um, enunciation on different words. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. When you put the other words in there, you use a different inflection. You see that the words mean the same, but you hear them anew. That God would somehow put those together for you in better. Verse 13 says, with my lips, I recount the laws that come from your mouth. So we're supposed to share it with someone. One of the best ways to hide God's word in your heart is to share it with someone. When when you know it so that you can share it, when you have it at a moment that you can recall it from your heart, that you're ready to give it to someone when they most need it. When you talk about it, when was the last time you read something from God, God's word, and it stuck with you and you shared it with someone else? 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and the things you have, you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Jeremiah 29, but if I say I will not mention him or speak any more his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. God does not call us to just read it, but to share it with others. Even if we're all quiet, the rocks will eventually cry out that the word would go forth. In scripture, it tells us to share. In our hearts and our souls, we want to share. It's not that we can learn something and hold it so tight that it isn't worth something to someone else. It is the handing off of those precious words, the things that God has put in our heart. Always talk about it. Rejoice on what you have read. Verse 14 says, I rejoice in the following of your statues as one rejoices with great riches. Do you remember a time when you read a a verse and you said, oh, oh, that that hurts the Lord when you want to do that. So you want to change. But the psalmist here says, I am so excited to follow God's commands. Remember a time also when you were tempted and walked away from it? 
Don't you feel good and joyous when you won the temptation? Feel great when you've lived without guilt? Genesis 39.9 says, No one is greater in this house than I am. My master with, will withhold nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. Then could I in such wicked things as sin against God. Luke 12, 12, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at the time, at that time, what you should say. So when you read it, you're supposed to rejoice and hold them as great riches, something great and valuable that you would pass to others. What's the use of, of money and wealth if you're not able to share What's the use of good news if you're not able to tell someone? Have you ever had something so exciting come to your heart that you can't wait to tell someone? What if we rejoiced in the words that we read from the Bible in that way, that we would go and say, look what I have found. Even if they've already found it, they might hear and see it in a new way. And God would work in that. Meditate on his word. I am meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. That was verse 15. It's not just reading it once. It's meditating on it the whole way. Joshua 1 8 says, do not let this book of law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So when you hold it in there, you're able to follow the word. And it is in the gift of grace that God gives us that even when we fail, God still redeems us. Even when we fall short, God still cares for us and moves us forward. In all of those things, the promise is the grace and the understanding of God. But to meditate on his word in our heart, to know those promises, to know Luke 219 says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. What, what does it mean when Mary knew what God had asked her? When the a angel Gabriel had come to her and given her the message from Lord. These are the things she had in her heart, the things that she kept and she pondered and she thought and she shared. When we meditate, we have the best ability to, when someone needs those words, pull them forth and hand them to them. Verse 16 says, I will delight in your decree. I will not neglect your word. The psalmist says here, I will not. I am going to do it. People say, I know what the Bible says, but we as Christians have to look at that and think that that's really not hearing all of God's word. God said, and I know without question, his love for me, his grace for me. Many times we put a button there. I know that God's word is beautiful and that I should start this new year with it on my heart. I should meditate on it. I should remember it. I should um, rejoice in reading it. I should teach others. I, shall, I should share it. I should care for it. I should do all of the things that God is asking me to do, to seek out God with my heart and to have these words hidden in my heart. But when we don't do that, I think we fall short of understanding how much God wants time with us. So if I was to give you all that money and ask you to spend $20 on me, it seems like such a little bit, but God has given you 1,440 minutes today. Some has already passed, but what do you intend to do with the rest of this day? Could you not give God 20 minutes to read his word that you might grow in your relationship with him? I want you to know I know 100% of the time that God's word changes us. We will be changed. We don't need to compromise. We need to grow in our commitment 
to who God is and who he is in our lives. When I encourage you to do this, I want to give you some statistics that this could be your new resolution, but some statistics that are interesting. The top 10 New Year's resolutions going into 2015, I don't know, they haven't produced what they are for this year, was to lose weight. Number two was get organized. Three, spend less, save more. Four, enjoy life to the fullest. Five, stay fit and healthy. Six, learn something exciting. Seven, quick smoking. Eight, help others in their dreams. Nine, fall in love. And ten, spend more time with family. Well, the New Year's resolution statistics say that 45% of Americans who usually make New Year's resolutions, 17 infrequently make them, and 38 say almost never. The people who are successful in achieving their resolutions is 8%. So people make resolutions are 10 times more likely to attain their goal than people who don't explicitly make resolutions. I resolve to read my Bible 20 minutes a day for this next year, starting now, January 1st, 2017. And if I miss or fail or skip a day, I know that God's grace will give that to me. And I can either go back and do it, or I can ask for his grace and continue forward. I don't want it to be something that is um, a, a chore for me, that I have to get this in. So when the, when the 100% of the multiple resolutions, educated relate, related resolutions are 47%, self-improvement. Weight loss is 38%. Money-related resolutions is 34%. And relationship is 31%. Isn't that interesting? But the rates of success, 39% of those in their 20s achieve their resolutions each year. And 14% of those over 50 meet their resolution every year. Is that because of how old they are? Or is that because... Um, over 50 are our resolutions are larger or are they less attainable i don't know most 75 percent of people will maintain that resolution through the first week 71 to two weeks 64 um, percent through one month and 46 percent over six months so that means that we have all that opportunity now these resolutions it was um i got it from uh, December 11th, 2016, from uh, the static brain is the, the person I got that all from. But if you make a, a resolution, if you make the resolution and make it something that is achievable, not I'm going to read the Bible in 90 days. Well, that's absolutely achievable, but with your time factors, with your family, with your work, is that something you can do? But we can all give 20 minutes to God. He has given us 1,440 as a large gift. What can we give back to him? I pray that you make a New Year's resolution that is about your soul, that's about taking care of yourself, about learning more and about doing more. My name is Eileen Hicks, and I am blessed to do this program called A Life Changed because God has changed my life. If you need anything, I work at Sydney First United Methodist Church, 230 East Poplar, 4929136. I'm extension 111. If there's something I can do or help you with. If there's a prayer request that you have, you can message me on Facebook, Eileen Hicks, H-I-X, or call the radio station or call the church, and they will get that to me, and I will be in prayer for you. I'm in prayer for you as a group. Let us pray now. Almighty God, I lift each person up that's hearing this. And God, I ask you to help us to decide on making a resolution for you, Lord, to help us to grow and learn more about you this year. So God, we lift it up to you. We ask, we ask this in your son, the name of Jesus.
your precious son. Amen. Well, I pray as you go through this year that it is marked with blessings from the Lord. Good times, good friends, and the ability to grow in his word. My name is Eileen Hicks, and this is A Life Changed.